With over a decade of additions and adjustments to Final Fantasy XIV, it is probably not a shock that a lot of features in the game have been entirely overhauled or outright removed for this or that reason. In this video, I want to go over and talk a bit about 10 features that have been removed or overhauled to such a massive degree that while it technically still exists, it might as well be a new system altogether. If you remember some old features you liked that were phased out or removed entirely, I would also love to hear about them in the comments. Number 1. Jobs requiring leveling 2 classes In A Realm Reborn, you actually needed to level the primary class of a job to level 30 and the secondary class of a job to level 15 to access the job. This meant, for example, that if you wanted to be a paladin but refused to ever touch a healer. Tough. You need conjurer at level 15 to ever become a paladin. Some of these made more sense than others, of course, and some just... I, I don't know what happened, but yeah. Bard required level 15 pugilist. Not sure on that one, but okay. Dragoon required level 15 in Marauder. Fun fact, in Stranger of Paradise, you also need both Lancer and Marauder to unlock Dragoon. Monk required 15 in Lancer. Again, also true in Stranger of Paradise. Warrior required 15 in Gladiator, which I suppose makes sense, and Paladin required 15 in Conjurer for the White Magic. White Mage required 15 in Arcanist, and Scholar and Summoner required 15 in Conjurer and Thaumaturge respectively, leading to a sort of healing magic, destructive magic difference between them. And then, of course, Black Mage required 15 in Archer, which I, I don't know why you're looking at me like that. It, it totally makes sense, right? Right? I don't know. An interesting result of this meant also that if you leveled Conjurer to 30, you already had the secondary prerequisite for two other jobs. With Heavensward, Machinist, Dark Knight and Astrologian started as jobs and did not have any prerequisites, meaning this feature was already phasing out by then. By Stormblood, the secondary class requirement was entirely removed. Number 2. Cross-class actions This of course goes hand in hand with the previous requirement. Typically, your job could access certain actions from the secondary class it required. This meant, for example, that paladins could use stone skin or raise. However, not in combat for that one, because that was apparently a trait that was learned by the healers. Warriors could access provoke, which was exclusive to gladiator, and black mages could access raging strikes from archer. There were of course also other examples, and you could usually access limited actions from one or two additional classes aside from the secondary class. The key limitation being that while playing a class, you often had a wider selection and could choose 10. As a job, you could only pick 5 in total among all the classes you had access to. This was of course resolved by the simple fact that you usually didn't want more than 5. The awkward result of this feature was that if a class learned a particularly generally helpful action for certain jobs, you could feel forced to level it, even if you weren't interested in it, as you needed the class at the appropriate level to access the action on your other jobs. Additionally, the fact that classes had a sort of quote-unquote advantage of having more cross-class space could lead some players to believe that it was a legitimately viable choice to use a class instead of a job. I heard there has been like one situation involving some weird game mechanics where class was temporarily better than its job back then, but in general this was not the case. With Heavensward, no new cross-class actions were added. You may also notice that all classes stop learning new actions after level 50, meaning that this feature was already phasing out by Heavensward. The feature was replaced with role actions, first edition you could say, in Stormblood. In retrospect, the problem with this feature was probably that each cross-class action was either entirely unhelpful to many, or it was mandatory, which didn't leave that much choice. Number 3. Choosing role actions With the role action feature replacing cross-class actions, it was probably no surprise that it was implemented with the same Choose 5 functionality that the cross-class actions had. The difference was that the role actions were more generally helpful things for each role. In fact, most of the role actions we still have today are some of the most uniquely helpful ones on the list. Most roles had around 10 options, but could only pick 5. Multiple of these role actions were yoinked from jobs and put in the role actions list to make them more widely available, of course. The issue with this system was, however, that now that the role actions were all 
handpicked to be helpful rather than just being available options from different classes that may or may not help you, most of the other options were good. Naturally, there were always better ones, so ultimately, most players would almost certainly land on their five favorites and never change, even though certain encounters called for different things. For example, as a tank, you had to choose between, like, four defensive cooldowns, rampart and arm's length included, low blow, interject, provoke and ultimatum, an area of effect version of provoke, and Naturally, some of these were more helpful in certain content compared to others. This system was then pretty much gone away with by Shadowbringers, by removing the more niche helpful ones and just giving you the rest with no demand to pick and choose. Number 4. Craft Across Class Actions This feature was removed in patch 5.1 of Shadowbringers. All crafters had a base set of actions with a lot of overlap, but each crafter also had a select few unique actions to that specific crafter. However, these kinds of unique actions were accessible through the cross-class system, which somehow stayed around for crafters and gatherers, although irrelevant, until 5.1. As a class, you could pick 10, and while many of them were outright removed with the rework, you might find it funny to know that some of the actions we take for granted were class-specific at one point, so you had to choose. For example, By Regards Blessing was from Carpenter. Waste Not, both versions, was Leather Worker. Careful Synthesis, both versions, was Weaver. Tricks of the Trade was Alchemist. Muscle Memory and Hasty Touch was Culinarian and both Manipulation and Innovation was Goldsmith. Armorsmith had Rabbit Synthesis, but I don't think we use that one much anymore. This was probably the real original reason why it made so much better sense to level all crafters together at once, rather than splitting them up. Because a Carpenter at max level was fine, but a Carpenter with all the cross-class options was much better, to the point of making it feel pointless to even consider only leveling one crafter, making the crafting feature feel much less approachable. Number 5. Tank and DPS Stances Before Shadowbringers, instead of having a simple enmity toggle and a level 1 passive that makes tanks take less damage, and quietly do less damage by the way, each tank had a dedicated tank stance. Two of them also had a dedicated damaging stance. Dark Knight had Grit, which reduced damage taken and done by 20% or so, while tripling enmity generation. It required a GZD to use, and also caused a bit of MP. While in Grit, you had access to Blood Price, which was a temporary buff that recovered MP and generated blood gauge whenever you were hit. While not in Grit, which you could exit by simply removing the buff, you could instead use Blood Weapon, which instead recovered MP and generated blood gauge on every physical attack you performed and also reduced the GCD timer by 10%. It also reduced TP needed by 20%, but we will get to that. Paladins had Shield Oath and Sword Oath, with Shield Oath reducing damage done and taken by 20% and tripling enmity generation. Both Oaths required a GCD to switch to. Shield Oath caused you to generate Oath Gauge by blocking or by casting Holy Spirit. Sword Oath instead added a massive potency bonus to your auto attacks, and caused them to generate Oath Gauge instead. Warrior had Defiance and Deliverance, with Defiance reducing damage done by 20% or so, and increasing your HP and healing received by 20% or so, a bit like Thrill of Battle today, and also tripling enmity. Defiance also gave access to Inner Beast as a Beast Gauge spender, which did okay damage, healed you and reduced damage taken by 20% for 6 seconds. You could also use Steel Cyclone, which also healed as a side effect. In Deliverance, you instead did 5% more damage and had access to Fell Cleave and Decimate, each simply doing significantly more damage than the Defiance alternatives. Warrior also had access to Unchained, which made you ignore the Defiance effect of reducing the damage you did for a little bit. Notably, Warrior could switch stands as an OGCD. This is because originally, switching stands removed all of your beast gauge as a price. However, this was removed very early in Stormblood. While these features sound like you had a lot of options, in an optimized group, the way you typically interacted with the tank stands was that the main tank entered combat in it, 
used one enmity combo, also a removed feature, and then switched to damage stance. After that, it was mostly up to the rest of the raid to manage their individual enmity to stay below. Furthermore, because of this, it was quite problematic for a paladin to main tank, since it was the only tank that could not freely exit their tank stance. Number 6. Meaningful Pet Bars Before Shadowbringers, we did not have player actions that ordered pets to do stuff, at least not very many. We instead had pet actions on the pet hotbar, which we could access separately. This also meant we could order the pet to use actions while we were doing something else. Both scholars Eos and Selene had three distinct actions in addition to Embrace, with Eos having Whispering Dawn, Fey Illumination and Fey Covenant, the two latter of which later being combined. Selene instead had Silent Dusk, an interrupt, Fey Caress, a raid-wide Isuna, and Fey Wind, a raid buff that reduced GZDs by 3% for 30 seconds on a minute cooldown. Similarly, Summoner's Garuda had a knockback and a magic damage increasing debuff akin to how Mug works now. Ifrit had a barrier that applied a slight physical vulnerability debuff when struck, and Titan had a stun and, well, essentially rampart since it was a real tank back then. These pets also had some other more spammable GZD attacks, but this is probably the reason why the pet hotbar is somewhat barren these days. Number 7. Converting gear into materia. This feature was replaced with Extract Materia in patch 5.2 of Shadowbringers. Before this, when you had fully spirit bonded with gear, you could choose to completely replace the gear piece with one random materia. This of course made materia significantly more valuable since they didn't naturally produce from your gear like they do now. However, the fear of doing this by accident has festered quite deep in more veteran players, so do remember to let them know that it is safe now. Number 8. Missing while the same level as your target. Before Stormblood, there was an accuracy or hit chance stat. You needed a certain amount of hit chance to be able to land your hits consistently and reliably from different angles. Magic attacks had a different lower requirement, non-frontal physical attacks had another one, and front attacks a third one, with Summoner's Pet requiring the non-frontal physical attacks ones. If you want to re-experience how this feels in Endwalker, simply grab a job you haven't reached level 90 with and fight a mob that is several levels above you. Whenever you miss, most of the effects of the attack completely fizzles. This includes combos failing so you have to start over, things like Fire 1, not resetting Astral Fire, and so on. Fun. After this rework, the stat was replaced with Direct Hit. Number 9. Combos fail if you miss the positional. Before Stormblood, the benefit of performing the positional correctly on an attack wasn't just slightly more damage. It was everything except the base damage it provided. This meant, for example, that if a Dragoon didn't get the backside positional for Chaos Thrust, then it didn't apply a dot, and it absolutely didn't lead into Wheeling Thrust. Other fun examples which I'm not 100% sure were phased out by Stormblood include Trick Attack not applying its damage buff if not used from behind, Bootshine not guaranteeing a crit if not from behind, and Samurai generating way less resources if not landing their positionals right. This one stayed until the end of Shadowbringers, by the way. Number 10. TP if you've seen older footage of Final Fantasy XIV, you may notice that in addition to the HP and MP bars, there's an additional resource bar called TP. This was removed with Shadowbringers. All physical attacks require TP, or tactical points, to use, and in particular, AoE attacks and often attacks with utility side effects like Shield Bash required a significantly larger amount of TP. You recovered 60 TP every 3 seconds naturally, which was fine, although starting a fight with 1000 and most actions requiring at least 60 TP meant that you would likely very slowly but gradually tire out over the course of a fight if you didn't use your TP management actions. AoE attacks often requiring over 100 also meant that big massive AoE pulls had to be resolved quickly lest you risk having a lot of angry mobs and not the energy to deal with them. Back then, this was more balanced by jobs like Black Mage who could AoE forever, dealing less bursty AoE damage but then being able to sustain it for longer. Even longer ago, Sprint actually caused all of your TP to activate, which of course meant that casters didn't mind, but all physical jobs had a massive issue with using Sprint. 
TP was removed in Shadowbringers, and incidentally, many jobs were given more fleshed out AoE combo sequences now that they could more reasonably access them. Now, that is all for this video, thank you so much for watching. If you want to support me and my channel, you can let the YouTube algorithm know by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing, sharing, and hitting the bell to get notified when next I post a video. And if you want to give even more support than that, you can also become a member of the channel like these wonderful people here. Fun fact, with no gauges before Stormblood, warriors had to build 5 stacks of a buff to use their spenders. These buffs gave effects that increased healing received or damage done, meaning that using Fell Cleave came with a temporary drop in sustained damage while you built back up. Certain abilities like Vengeance also generated a stack, but only Infuriate gave you all 5 instantly.